two and a half years, um, teaching and doing research. Before that, I was at Michigan Tech, where we have the um, for about 15 years. So I studied a lot of trout in Michigan, and then I've been in Wyoming, Montana as well. So I'm going to sort of back out from the details of each individual stream and talk to you more about trout movement in general, focusing on the trout property and brown trout. Um, first, I know you all are very knowledgeable. Why do they move? Why do trout move? Food? Reproduction. Yep, spawning. Okay. Yep, water temperature. I hear mumbling, but I can't. It's hard to Avoid predators. Yep, avoid predators. Competition. Yep, breeding good. Yeah, so you, you know what's happening here. There's lots of disparate reasons. Um, people have studied trout movement for a long time. I've, I focused on it mainly in Cuffer Trout in Wyoming. And when you sort of try and get, get your head around it, it's good to think about what stream trout in particular need to complete their life histories, mm -hmm. right? So there are three basic habitat types we think about. Spawning habitat, feeding habitat, and refuge habitat. And the really important thing for stream fish is they have to get back and forth to these habitats, right? Sometimes one stream has it all, and sometimes it doesn't need to move long distances. So that's what we think about. Um, Fish have to move to and from spawning habitat. Of course, this depends what time of year they spawn. Um, when they get to feeding habitat, they have to move to different habitats. As Bruce said, the streams have different amounts of food. If one area doesn't have good food, they move within those streams or among streams for feeding. And then, of course, they move back and forth to refuge habitat. This might be just during the day, right, to escape predators, to escape competitors, um, but also over season, right? In the summer, they're out feeding. Flows get lower, um, they move downstream, they hunger down in pools where water's a little warmer, they may move to avoid ice. Um, so they need refuge from things like cold temperature in winter, warm temperature in summer, um, stream flow, right? Sometimes there's flooding flow, which can be difficult, especially for small trout. Um, sometimes there's low flow and they have to move to escape that. Poor growth conditions, so basically food. They move to find food as well. Um, and then depending on what type of fish you've got, um, they might move then from refuge habitat to spawning habitat if there's are spawning species. So this is just sort of an overview of what we think about when we're thinking about why fish are moving. Um, and I'm not going to talk to you about all the reasons because it would take a long time. Spawning and food are obvious ones. Um, this is not a brook trout or a brown trout. Do you know what this is? Yeah. So it's a cutthroat trout um, spawning in, in uh, Wyoming. Um, so we know that there's usually a pulse of movement when, when people study fish movement. Um, for cutthroat, cutthroat, that happens to be spring. For brook trout and brown trout, of course, that's, that's fall. Um, so we're going to skip over that. I'm going to talk a little bit about temperature because we talk, it's important for winter um, and, and summer. So, of course, in winter, trout tend to move to avoid, in many cases, ice. Right? They don't want to be in shallow, very cold streams that are frozen. They tend to, this tends to be a movement downstream into pools. Um, Water is warmer, at, is, 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 is um, denser at 4 degrees, so those pools may be cold on top, but they're warmer down below. They might move to beaver ponds. That's a place that holds trout in the winter. Um, we also see trout moving in the summer, mainly away from warm water temperature. So we all know trout are cold water species. This is particularly a problem in streams where there's no overhead vegetation to shade the stream. It makes a huge difference to have vegetative cover for water temperature. Um, so when that has disappeared, you often see trout moving away from those areas. So when we look at a stream and, and look at stream temperature, um, this is not Minnesota. This is, happens to be like a sort of typical stream um, sort of pathway, but it's from Oregon. What I want you to look at is the different colors, right? And this is your cheat sheet for those of you who don't think about Celsius, right? So, and I can't do the calculation in my head. So you can see that in the purple in the headwaters, it's like 15, 16, which is like 59 to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. And then down in the main stem, in this example, it's almost up to 80, right? So that's a huge variation in temperature. If you just walked from one stream to the next, you would not feel that degree in the air, right? There's much more variation in water temperature than there is in air temperature. Fish are really good at finding places where they need to be, either escaping from warm water temperature and finding cold water seeps, or getting away from cold temperature and finding warm, warm temperature. And sometimes streams don't look like that, right? Sometimes you've got warm, warm up here, or very warm here, cold down here. So this is, we often think of it this way, but this is often not what happens. Um, streams I studied were 28 degrees C, which is almost 80 degrees up here, um, and much cooler downstream. So knowing your temperature is important. And 
there's daily fluctuations. I will get there. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Next, <laughs> daily fluctuations. So as Bruce was saying, this is, this is more annual fluctuation, but as Bruce said, know your stream. Where does the water come from in your stream? Is it surface driven or is it groundwater fed? So again, hypothetical streams here, um, sort of a main stem and two tributaries. I'm not tall enough to point to that. Um, so if we look at this one tributary with the orange dot on top, that's a groundwater fed stream. So if we're looking at the annual flow, and Bruce showed you data like this as well, you can see it starts out at 10, which is like 50 degrees Fahrenheit over here. Um, it doesn't get to freezing, and in the summer it doesn't get that warm. So if you're a trout and everything, is, everything else is pretty good in that stream in terms of food and predators, you're not going to have to move in, in response to temperature. You're, you're in a pretty good place. Now, the second tributary is an example of a surface water fed channel, right? So um, here we're still seeing the same annual um, time period. And again, temperature here, your little cheat sheet for Celsius to Fahrenheit. Um, and you can see it, it freezes almost in the winter. It gets quite warm in the summer. And if this is beyond you as the trout who's living there's ideal conditions, you might leave. And so what happens in warm water tributaries um, they tend to leave, they may go down to the main stem, they may move up into the cold water tributary. So temperature is really important for, for why fish move. Um, and I think sometimes people forget to think about it and forget to think about how variable stream temperature is. Compared to, we live in air, we don't think about it. The stream temperature is really variable. Another interesting thing that um, people don't often think about is how do species interactions affect fish movement, right? This is particularly an issue um, in Minnesota, right, we have, you don't know what these are. <laughs> Which one's native? <laughs> Where does this come from? <laughs> Just keeping everyone awake, I knew you would know. Um, so there's lots of interesting information. You know, these species didn't co-evolve, right? They didn't live together here for more than whenever we introduced them 100 or so years ago. Um, and we think of brook trout as maybe more cold water species. They tend to live in the headwaters. Brown trout are more tolerant of warm water conditions. They tend to be slightly more tolerant of polluted conditions and sedimentation. Um, and we tend to think of brown trout as being able to beat up on brook trout as adults, like maybe brown trout kick brook trout out of places. But lab studies with juveniles say that juvenile brook trout can kick out juvenile brown trout. So there's lots of interesting species interactions that determine where these fish are longitudinally in a stream. Um, and so this is true in Minnesota. I'm going to show you an example of this in Michigan. Um, so it's not super important that you, there's a bunch of lakes and, and we don't need to think about those lakes, but I want to show you, um, this is the Maple River, so it's got two uh, tributaries and then this is the main stem. You can see the direction of flow here. Um, we sampled trout for many years where those four stars are. Um, and I want to show you the distribution of particularly brook trout and ground trout as you go from upstream to downstream. Um, this is the dam, I don't have time to talk to you about it, but it's been removed, which has another interesting component. Um, to this drainage. So I just want to show you these data. The data are not up there yet. Um, I'm going to show you on the y-axis percent of total trout, so on, on that axis. And then on the y-axis, I'll just show you sites from upstream to downstream. Brown trout will be orange, brook trout will be blue, rainbow trout are red, but there's only like two, so we can not talk about this. Um, so this is typically what you see, is that brook trout in the blue are dominant in upstream reaches. This happens to be a tiny tributary that's full of brown trout, about, I mean brook trout about that big, who eat snails and mundanos actually, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then as we move downstream, brook trout drop out and brown trout increase. So this is very typical. Now, is this because of competitive interactions? Is it because it's a little bit deeper downstream? This is a very pristine stream all the way down. Um, water temperature is still very cold. So it's interesting to try and figure out why this is happening. Um, a dam has been removed about here. So we're interested to find out if brown trout are going to move upstream or not. So interesting distributions. And you find similar things in terms of uh, trout distributions in Minnesota. Another question that maybe people don't think about all the time, but I think about all the time, is is there inter individual variation within species? Like, are some brook trout movers and some brook trout stayers? Do some fish always migrate and some fish hang around in the same reach of stream? Um, and people have studied this for a long time. An extreme example in Minnesota are um, coaster brook trout versus inland brook trout, right? Um, what are these? What do they do? Coasters. Migrate. Yeah, they live in Lake Superior and they spawn in the stream. Um, they start out in the stream and they migrate to the lake. 
And we are the same species, right? There's no difference here. Um, and in some of those coastal brook trout streams, you find inland brook trout populations. So one of the interesting questions here is, and this is true for Pacific salmon as well, why does this happen? Is there some small genetic difference? Maybe. Is there a small genetic difference that's combined with maybe increased growth as juveniles that causes some fish to develop and some fish to stay? So this is an extreme example. But what about in a stream, you know, in just in a stream population of, say, brook trout or brown trout? And we do see this individual variation. You have to remember that it's hard, it's hard to know what all the fish are doing. They're underwater and we're not there. So one of the tricky parts is sampling. But when we sample across fish, what we tend to see is there's quite a few quote unquote stayers or residents, fish that maybe don't move quite so far. Um, you get a few that migrate a little farther, and then some that go really long distances. So studying this in cutthroat trout, we had fish that didn't move at all over the year to some that moved 82 kilometers after spawning. So there's a lot of variation. Um, we don't necessarily exactly know why, um, but it's not two groups. It's sort of a continuum. And what's really important is the variation, right? So if you think about stream ecosystems, they are um, variable, right? Some years there's drought. Some years there's super high flow. Some years it's very cold and there's a lot of ice formation. You add humans into the mix and they're extremely unpredictable, right? Sedimentation, agriculture, dams. So <clears throat> if you have this variation in individual tendencies, some fish migrate, some fish are resident, if some community over here in this little tributary blinks out, migrators can come from other parts of the stream to fill in and recolonize. So it's that variation um, that's important. So what? What can we say in general about fish movement? It's complicated. Um, fish move more in harsh or less stable streams. So if you're thinking about figuring out where fish are, um, groundwater fed streams are fairly stable with good habitat, those fish are going to move less than maybe surface water streams or streams that are highly impacted by sedimentation. Um, when you're thinking about where fish are, and probably <coughs> most of you know this because you're often thinking about where fish are, um, distance to cover and temperature refuges are important. That can be important in summer and winter. So we think about, oh, there's largely debris, great, there's going to be a trout there. Um, but if it's summer and you have a groundwater seep nearby, that, that's really a good chance that the fish is going to be there. Likewise in winter, um, if you're thinking about where fish are huddled up in some place deep or in a, in a beaver dam is, is a good place to look. Habitat connectivity is super critical. Almost every study that you read about fish movement says, oh, fish move more than they expect, right? People sort of think of fish staying in their same pool all their lives, but they really don't do that. They move around a ton. Um, and what they really, when you're thinking about where they have to go, they have to complete their life history. Any of these get cut off, you know, not good. So we do that, we do this a lot, right? Road culverts can be problems, as you all know. Um, irrigation dams or other dams can be problems, as you all know. One really interesting thing that I think um, is changing in research is thinking about what's that? Beaver, beaver dams as potential barriers. So in the United States, we tend to blow them up because we think that trout can't pass them, right? It's very common to do that. Um, because we look at this from a human perspective and we say, oh, there's no way we think it's swim over that, right? But it turns out that when people actually study a fish from downstream to upstream, they can pass through. A lot of these beaver dams are more permeable than they look. So there's a study that came out a few years ago. Damn good, beavers may restore barrel streams and fish populations. So this was a big paper um, looking at steelhead populations in Oregon. So they had two large drainages, one where they did nothing. They had been heavily impacted by grazing, and one where they reintroduced beavers and also put in like fake beaver dams. Um, and they saw large increases in, in fish fish coming back because beaver dams were not as impermeable, not as impermeable as we think they are, and they have a, a lot of other really great ecosystem things that happen that are good for trout. And you have to remember that beavers and trout, brook trout, have been together for like a really long time, right? They co-evolved. So food for thought, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's a very good question. Um, in some studies, yes, and some studies, no. So when you're thinking about spawning, 
it tends to be large females tend to move farther, at least in some studies, they tend to move farther. But not, not everyone finds that. Um, it's kind of an unknown. So people think of large fish as moving further, but often small fish have to move around more because they're not as competitively dominant, right? A big fish can go where it wants because it can beat out every other fish. So Tom, sometimes it's those small fish who are making more local movements to try and <coughs> avoid the big fish and find something to eat. So. Did, did altitude or elevation of the actual creeks that you've been exposed to mm -hmm. impact the presence of the type of uh, species of fish? No, not so much. Um, we were not super high at, in terms of elevation. Um, our streams were unusual, not in Michigan, but in um, Wyoming, in that um, they were very warm upstream or called downstream. In the Michigan streams, they're not. there's not much difference in elevation at all. Yeah, and it's much shallower upstream. So when that dam goes, I mean, the dam is gone. It'll be interesting to see if that changes. I just know Southwest, where I'm not from, we find that the brooks are more prominent at that elevation. Yes. They handle the, the cooler water. Yes. It typically is cleaner. Yes, it is. And that's, and that's the hypothesis for, for many of those. Um, for this as well, although that stream in Michigan is actually, the whole thing is in very, in very sort of pristine shape and really cold. So it's kind of interesting to see what will happen. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about posters. OK. Do my best. I've always heard that Lake Superior is a very unfertile lake. Mm -hmm. It's very cold, and, and yet coasters are much larger yeah. than their stream yeah. rookies. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, then do they eat? I guess my question is do coasters eat different things? Mm -hmm. Probably. Probably they eat fish a lot. Yeah, more. that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll probably become high scores. It's, it's mainly feeding. So they'd be like steelhead. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. So steelhead, kokanee, uh, which are our, our lake-run, landlocked um, salmon. Yeah, so they tend to eat. They tend to eat different things, which is why they get so much bigger. And there's enough for them to eat there. Yeah. And there's also large, large herb um, invertebrates. Yeah, they, they migrate. Yeah, so there's bigger invertebrates as well. Oh really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. Not as many as other, but I mean, yeah, there are. There's, there's enough. Yeah. So there are invertebrates in Lake Superior that are like really big studs. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.